Next up, United Kingdom. Oh, look, Ross. <sighs> Miss Lawrence, your question. Is there a place for the British monarchy in the 21st century? The royals are in big trouble with their subjects. Talk to the cabbie down in Trafalgar or the shopkeeper in Soho and they'll tell you. The royal family is too stuffy, out of touch, aloof, too removed from ordinary people and their ordinary problems. There's a growing movement in this country to make the royals, well, less royal. Because the downside to having kings and queens and lords and ladies is believing that birthright makes you better than everyone else. And it doesn't. So, should we dump the royal family? Talk to that same caviar shopkeeper and chances are they'll bite your head off for even suggesting it. Being part of a country is like being part of a family. Just because we complain about them doesn't mean that they don't have a warm place in our hearts. The Queen still represents Britain in a uniquely British way. And I, for one, would feel a little lost without her. Thank you. All right. We're getting into it. Mm -hmm. Cheers, Ted. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Hi, how are you? Welcome to the Catella Bubble. Let's get into it. So we're here to talk about Harry and Meghan, okay? Uh, if you're not in the same space and place as I am currently as I'm making this video, Harry and Meghan have recently released two parts of a mini series documentary docu-series thing. Okay, I don't know what it's technically called. Yeah. They've released six episodes that is trying to tell their side of the sort of royal family drama, royal family story, as sort of explanation of why they left and to kind of sort of set the record straight because there's a lot of sort of misinformation, disinformation. Internet's like sort of wild west. Uh, the media in the UK is sort of the wild, wild west. So this is their attempt to sort of say their piece. That's my understanding, at least. The reason why I decided to like start talking about this is because this story has literally like cracked my brain because not only do I feel like the story itself is really fascinating, but the way that it's being covered by the British media right now is part of the story. And the way that the online discourse has become so negative and so toxic that I can't seem to find anybody like reasonable, like in some online spaces is a little bit crazy to me. And it's especially crazy to me that the British media is sort of playing into exactly the sort of things that Harry and Medigan are accusing them of doing. Just showing once and for all that British people never learn. <laughs> oh, so, listen, don't cancel me, okay? This is my first video. Can I just, please don't cancel me for the first video, okay? So before you click away, what I'm gonna be talking about is not necessarily about all of the royal drama, all the royal stuff. I, that's kind of a tangential thing to me. I don't really care about Harry and Meghan. I, they seem fine. Everyone, I, I don't know these people. What I thought would be more interesting is just to speak to my own experiences, my sort of tangential connections to monarchy, to the royal family, to the UK, and just hoping to share sort of an outsider's perspective and some unique stories, unique perspectives related to this incident, but to kind of like zoom out from the documentary a little bit from all the just sort of crazy hate, crazy misinformation, and to just 
uh, speak normally. Just have a conversation, uh, analyze, think about, and uh, discover a new perspective. That, that's what we're here for. I know that I don't have a platform, nobody's listening to me, but I figure why not start having a voice in the conversation? You know, because we hear so much about them and their lives and their relationships and, and all this stuff can, can feel like it's so up here and so inaccessible. But if we take our own perspectives and we kind of think about ourselves and, and tell our stories, then maybe, maybe we can like reframe this to be deeper than tabloid fodder. Maybe it can be something bigger than that. Sed tuis altus amor parantros fuit altiorilo, qui tamen indominatam fere iguam docuit. juicy this video gonna be messy i have no idea how i'm gonna edit this <laughs> oh god <laughs> help me <laughs> jesus christ i've sort of narrowed down three experiences that i've had that i think are tangentially connected to this story that reinforce the themes and messages of the documentary without necessarily getting bogged down in the specifics of the documentary or the specific this and that and, and just looking at my experience and my thoughts as someone that has had the experiences that I've had. Experience one, the University of St. Andrews. The town on the windy coast of Fife is home to Scotland's oldest university. And it was here that a fresh-faced, floppy-haired Prince William was dropped off by his father in 2001. Not quite your average student, but one who wanted to have, as far as he could, a normal life here. And today, the couple were back. A future king and queen, of course, but in the place where their relationship began. Actually, being a student is a great leveller. One of the things that um, the Duke really enjoyed about St Andrews was that it treated him as much as it could like anybody else, like any other student. Back to where it all began, Kate Middleton and Prince William arrive at St Andrews, the Scottish University, where they met as students. been just three three and a half years obviously so far where um, I've been very independent and and been left alone to sort of study and do my own thing really. People are saying that you know it's impossible to live a normal life really but actually up here and with the media out of it um, it's amazing how people will just get on with their lives and, and not bother you. Ooh you know what hang on I got a surprise I got a surprise let's go Listen, this bitch ain't playing, okay? You know what it is. If you know, you know, okay? If you know, you know. I'm gonna do it like this. I'm gonna do it like this, like, yes. Hang on, I gotta take off the Jack Wills for a moment. I went to the University of St. Andrews. It is a university that is, in the UK at least, considered relatively prestigious. The joke is that people that go to St. Andrews are the people that can't get into Oxford or Cambridge. I won't say that's totally accurate, but I mean... 
Mm. <laughs> By the way, this is an authentic experience. I just pulled this out of an inside pocket in here. And these are all debate pamphlets from the University Debating Society. Should we read some? Some debates that were happening on campus at the time? Oh, look at this one. This house has no confidence in Her Majesty's government, with the four being supported by a UKIP candidate. Who are you? Okay. Nobody in Europe had ever heard of you. Great. An argument about tuition fees. This house believes national treasures should be returned to their country of origin. Based. Oh, look at this. Look at this one. This house believes print media is dead. Wow, wow, wow. Oh, oh. This house believes that a good old fashioned leak is better than freedom of information. Can't make this shit up, folks. Can't make this shit up. This house believes that feminism is redundant in 21st century Britain. This house would rather have Britain's constitution than America's. Bro, what constitution? Don't give me that shit. Can't make this shit up, folks. Can't make this shit up. I didn't just put on the red robe to like flex on everyone. I put this on because just so happens the University of St. Andrews is where Prince William famously met Kate Middleton. Now, that wasn't when I was there. Listen, I, I'm not that old, okay? I will say that much. I'm not that old. It was a, a foundational part of the university's identity. That sort of connection to the royal family, to prestige, was a big deal when I was there. You would see signs on different businesses saying, you know, Wills met Kate here for coffee once. And it might be 20 years on, but students in this town still talk about the time Wills and Kate were here. You find out where their, their flats used to be, which halls they were in, it's always discussed. Right, there was, is there a guided tour of St Andrews, <laughs> of places where William and Kate used to live? Yeah, there probably could be. Um, in cafes, there's signs that, you know, Will and Kate used to go here for coffee. I think it was Will said that you either leave St Andrews married or an alcoholic. I'm not one of them, but I'm definitely leaning towards one of them. <laughs> I won't ask which one. Weird sort of connections to the Prince William, Kate Middleton story, the, the love story. It became part of like St. Andrew's sort of marketing of itself as like the, the university to find love, to find a match. And uh, going to the university, you would hear all sorts of, of things connected to Prince William and Kate Middleton and the royal family in general. They were a part of the institution in a way. In fact, right around the time where they got engaged, they came to the university. The royal couple whose fairy tale romance started here in 2003 were invited to help launch the university's 600th anniversary celebrations. Royal fans in the town have been preparing for the visit ever since it was announced last week. A crowd of well-wishers gathered to catch a glimpse of the prince and his fiancée despite the winter weather as they met dignitaries from the university. They gave a speech. Well, I say they, I don't think Kate did anything, but William gave a speech and then they did what I 
didn't know, but now after the documentary, know is called a walkabout. Funnily enough, I was in, you know, the crowd of one of these walkabouts. And I have, and I swear I'm not making this up, I have shaken Kate Middleton's hand. I've touched that lady. You know, consensually. And, and part of being at St. Andrews at that time was I had entered into a world it, it was the it was the closest I had ever come to people that had that sort of genuine prestige, that had, you know, royal heritage, that were coming from these super, super affluent backgrounds. The, that connection to an upper class that is not only just inaccessible if you're poor, but is also inaccessible if you're rich because it is an exclusive club. And St. Andrews actually really struggled with this reputation. I'm sure it existed before the royal family, but it was definitely an image problem for them. There were lots of stories that made it seem like St. Andrews was this like super elitist place. They had problems with elite groups, boys only clubs, you know, doing the milk challenge with Kava, like, stupid rich kid stuff. But th that was their perception. It was the elite of the elite go to fuck around, I guess. While I was there, I definitely heard stories and read stories about William's experience there. We traded in that gossip. I remember it, things that we knew about the connection between Will and Kate and the university were things like Kate Middleton wearing that like see-through dress and the tabloid saying that it was like her, you know, trying to catch William's eye and all this stuff. There were sort of stories about their dating life in university. We joke, you know, they met down in the lizard. Down in the lizard, I saw you dancing. But grinding up to you was the future king. I want your love. Love, 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 I want your love. The lizard is trash. <laughs> if you know, you know. Listen, who out here a messy as shit in their dating life? Okay. Now we're here for the tea. I call this part of the video messy will shit. As much as the royal family and Prince William want to play it off like William had a regular degular, totally normal life at the University of St. Andrews, he really did not. Sometime this century, this student prince is destined to become king. And he needs to come to terms with the fact that he was done dirty. He was done dirty in many different ways. And Kate Middleton was done dirty in many, many different ways. And yet St. Andrews markets themselves based on them being alumni and their participation at the university. If the university wants to capitalize on Will and Kate's relationship, then they should be telling that story accurately. The truth is Will and Kate both in their own ways seemed hesitant about the University of St. Andrews. It turns out both Prince William and Kate Middleton originally wanted to go to the University of Edinburgh. Obviously, they didn't know each other at the time, so they weren't making that decision together. In Tina Brown's book, The Palace Papers, she writes, When the news was announced in 2000 that Prince William would be spending his university years at the small Scottish University of St. Andrews, Kate suddenly bailed out of Edinburgh University 50 miles away and reapplied at St. Andrews. In American terms, it was like choosing between a large, broad-based Ivy League university and a bijou liberal arts college. Now, just a side note, I, I fundamentally disagree with that, but <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Edinburgh has a humming city and festival life and a stellar reputation in art history versus the romantic seclusion of the medieval St. Andrews campus, surrounded by cobblestones marking where Protestant martyrs were burned at the stake. On the ground in front of me are the initials PH marked in stone. This marks the spot where a Protestant reformer, Patrick Hamilton, was burnt at the stake during the Reformation. There is a legend tied in with the PH that says that if any student stands on it, they are cursed to fail their degree. It was not Kate's style to blow off something she had worked so hard to achieve, then blithely take a gap year and reapply to somewhere the exact opposite in ambiance. Carol was the chancer in the family, not Kate. 
Now, you can do what you want with the insinuation that Kate Middleton's mom was interfering in trying to get Kate Middleton to switch universities. I don't know how true that is, but the young prince, like Kate, had preferred Edinburgh as a first choice, but royal protection officers deemed the setting too exposed to ensure his safety. Brian Lang, the principal and vice chancellor of St. Andrews, had multiple conversations with the palace about the best way to protect him. Prince Charles had visited himself and checked out the proposed Hall of Residence, St. Salvatore's, bouncing on a student bed. Hmm, this will do. One of the most obvious barriers to having a normal life was the concerns about security. St. Andrews was specifically chosen precisely because it was easier to give William the security that he needed. The royal family knew that William was in a very dangerous and precarious situation. In Sally Bettle Smith's book, Prince Charles, The Passions and Paradoxes of an Improbable Life. She writes, 18-year-old William's maturity was on display when he held his first press conference on September 29, 2000. The purpose of the meeting with reporters and photographers from around the world was to thank the media for leaving him alone while he was at Eton. The British press agreed to let Prince William complete his schooling in peace. Afterwards, he thanked them at Highgrove, his father's home. I was a bit um, anxious about how everything was going to turn out, but thanks to everyone, it's been, it really has been brilliant. They've all left me alone in the beginning. The whole of Eton made a real big difference with everyone not trying to sort of snap a picture every time I was walking around the streets. And I hope it just continues for Harry as well when he's there. A robust deal was negotiated with the Press Complaints Commission that while William was at St. Andrews, the press would continue to leave him alone until after he graduated. The original deal that the PCC struck with newspaper editors for Eton was extended to cover William until he finished full-time education. He will inherit an ancient throne and be called King William V. In this kind of environment, there was no way that William was going to have a quote-unquote normal life at the University of St. Andrews. No matter what the press or what he says in interviews, this was not a normal existence. I've had um, lots of kids come up and ask for my autograph. Um, I've had grandmothers stop me and ask me um, if they know any good places to buy underwear. Um, I've had... Um, no, actually, I don't. I was a bit stuck by that one. But Catella Bubble, you might ask. The press had a deal. And since Prince William was mostly left alone, the rest of his time should have been smooth sailing, right? Oh, no. The public still clamoured for information about his life and about the type of girls the most eligible bachelor in the world would date. Well-bred girls were linked with William and the hunt was on to find his secret girlfriends. What sort of girl does William really like? Even the director of the PCC reports that St. Andrew's students themselves were concerned about Prince William arriving at the university and whether they could even bond with him. Lord Black states, Andrew Neal said that students were worried they would find themselves in the papers if they hung out with or were seen around William. So I went up there. We approached the church where the meeting was taking place and I said, what's that queue of people? and it became rapidly clear that it was a line trying to get into a 500-seat church when I was expecting about 50. I was bombarded with questions about whether indiscreet behavior anywhere near William would end up on the front page. It made you realize what that was like for William to have this issue loom so large with people who befriended him. William was so paranoid about whom he could trust that he sometimes fed new people in his circle tidbits that were untrue and waited to see if they leaked. But people who try to take advantage of me and get a piece of me, I spot it quickly and soon go off them. He told the BBC's Jenny Bond in 2001. Not only was William rightfully worried about his friends betraying him or even just any student at the University of St. Andrews betraying him, he had to worry about his own family betraying him. And that starts with Prince Edward 
Charles's 35-year-old brother was trying to make his way in the world as a television producer, and in the two years since their wedding, Sophie had continued to run her own public relations firm. The Duke's inability to understand his brother's position, public opinion, and the fact that you can't have two kings in one country made conflict almost inevitable. All these factors and events combined to produce one of the major elements of the tragedy, the breakdown of relations between the Duke and his family. They inevitably blamed Wallace, who became even more despised, which made it all the more difficult for the Duke to return. Yet, he continued to remain optimistic, especially about his prospects for a job. Unfortunately, Edward, now 35, had media aspirations. His attempts to get into the television business had been a low wattage embarrassment for some time. After a brief delusion that he could be an actor as a production assistant at Andrew Lloyd Webber's really useful group, he had formed Ardent Productions, a TV company funded by himself and a few royal charity donors, such as the Sultan of Brunei, in 1993. In September 2001, Ardent's camera crews showed up at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, where the 19-year-old Prince William had just arrived as a freshman student. Knowing that there was a press ban brokered by Lord Black and the Press Complaints Commission on photographing or filming him at college without permission, William contacted his father to complain. Father and son were both astonished to learn the crew belonged to none other than the misbegotten TV company run by Uncle Eddie. Only days after William's arrival at St. Andrews, a two-man crew from Edwards Production Company was seen on campus filming for an American documentary series called Royalty from A to Z. When they were told to leave, they insisted they had permission from Edward. The Daily Mail said that the Prince of Wales was incandescent, one of Boland's favorite words, and described him fuming in his sitting room at Highgrove, refusing to take Edward's phone calls. It was leaked that Charles had called his brother a fucking idiot. True friends of William had to get used to being stalked and, it was later revealed, phone hacked by the press. Hi baby, it's me. He also called Kate Babykins. The prince was lucky to just miss the launch of Twitter and Facebook in 2006 and all the subsequent torments of social media that doubtless await his son, Prince George, when he attends university in the future. How dare you behave like you've done my children? How I have dare not. You? I have not You're done anything. You're stalking around here looking for us and our children. I went for a I'm quiet a bike ride with my children on That's Saturday. Fine. That's fine. And you won't give me your name. You're outrageous. You're disgusting. You really are. The monarchy doesn't have any real power. It's a constitutional monarchy. But I think William would make a wonderful, young, vibrant figurehead. For, for, for us to look up to. William did not settle into life at St. Andrews as smoothly as anticipated. He disliked the remote location on the North Sea and found the town constraining. He was studying art history, which failed to capture his interest. Home for Christmas after his first semester in 2001, William horrified his father and Mark Boland with the news he wasn't going back. He was bored by St. Andrews for all the reasons his police protection liked it. The timing of his news could not have been worse. The palace had strategic reasons for wanting the heir to the throne to study north of the border. In 1998, Scotland voted for devolution, and after the passing of the Scotland Act, important powers from Westminster were transferred to a newly established Scottish parliamentary body. There was a feeling at the palace, and among conservatives generally, that the break might herald something worse, the gradual sliding away of Scotland from the clutches of the Union. I don't think I was homesick, William recalled. I was more daunted. University officials were dismayed that the second in line to the throne might leave, fearing a public relations disaster. After some long conversations, Charles urged him to try another semester, and William was able to change to a geography major. But even this seemed to be contentious. Andrew Neal says he told university administrators opposed to this change of course, do you have any idea of the reputational damage that will be done to the university if William drops out? I don't care if he wants to study Welsh basket weaving. I don't give a monkeys. He can study whatever he wants. Get this on camera. Ah, he forgot your boots. <laughs> we get along, you know, really well, her and I and my father, you know, we're a very close family. Um, there are disagreements, obviously, as all families do, and when they are, they're, you know, they're big disagreements. Um, but when there's happy times, we have, you know, really good time. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's difficult getting all of three of us in the same house at one point because obviously father's really busy. Um, Harry's 
traveling or wherever and uh i'm up here so it's um it's just difficult but yeah it's 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 all good i should have my microphone oh my god i'm such an idiot okay Oh boy, you say you're gonna just make one easy, one easy video. You say you're just gonna talk to the camera and then like just really edit it. Short, easy video and not a project that's ballooned out into like a million different things. But, but what, what the, the fuck, fuck does, does this, this have, have to do with Harry, with Harry and Meghan? Obviously, at this point in the video, you just want to fucking know. What's this bitch trying to say? What's the connection here? Why are we talking about... Prince William. Why are we talking about St. Andrews? Why, why, why? Where's this going? The story of Prince William and St. Andrews is one small snippet of a larger conversation about Will and Harry's connection to trauma and to toxic family dynamics. Now, before we get into that then, first question being is, what is trauma? Trauma is the lasting emotional response that often results from living through a distressing event. Experiencing a traumatic event can harm a person's sense of safety, sense of self, and ability to regulate emotions and navigate relationships. Long after the traumatic event occurs, people with trauma can often feel shame, helplessness, powerlessness, and intense fear. Traumatic events experienced early in life, such as abuse, neglect, and disrupted attachment, can often be devastating. Now, it's important to keep in mind as well that abuse is not just physical abuse, it's emotional abuse, it's mental abuse, it's, it's all types of abuse that take advantage of other people, exploit other people, dominate or control other people, manipulate people, all of that is abuse. Equally challenging can be later life experiences that are out of one's control, such as a serious accident, being the victim of violence, living through a natural disaster or war, or a sudden unexpected loss. Trauma can affect one's beliefs about the future via loss of hope, limited expectations about life, fear that life will end abruptly or early, or anticipation that normal life events won't occur e.g. access to education, ability to have a significant and committed relationship, good opportunities for work. Common symptoms of people who have experienced trauma are things like re-experiencing the trauma, having flashbacks, having nightmares to those traumas, having repetitive thoughts, repetitive fears about those traumas, feeling on edge, feeling irritable, becoming more isolated, becoming more withdrawn, giving up on pursuing things that you enjoy, things that you want to do, having angry outbursts, mental health problems like depression, anxiety, drug misuse, alcohol misuse. What is toxicity? What does it mean to have a toxic family dynamic? The word toxic gets thrown around a lot, but toxic family dynamics have specific mechanisms in which they perpetuate harm against members within it. And I want to be clear, toxic does not mean someone is intentionally, maliciously, evilly creating a dynamic to create hostility, to create toxicity. Often, most everybody in a toxic family dynamic is dealing with their own traumas, their own issues that they are then magnifying throughout the entire dynamic. Some signs may include but are not limited to splitting, planting seeds where jealousy, resentment, and anger flourish, hitting, setting family members against each other, usually through dishonesty, smear campaigns, premeditated efforts to tarnish another person's reputation and character, usually by lying and deceit, often delusional in nature, chronic disrespect and contempt, becomes angry and protests when you assert your boundaries. One or both parents exploit the children and treat them as possessions whose primary purpose is to respond to the physical and or emotional needs of the adults. Supportive family members should support your basic needs by setting boundaries, providing discipline and affection, taking care of your health and well-being, making sure you received education, which I would also want to add should be receiving the education you want to receive, refusal to apologize, controlling, you feel controlled. Toxic family members might try to control major aspects of your life, including your relationships and career decisions. Compliance with role expectations and with rules is expected 
without any flexibility. Often these families rigidly adhere to a particular belief, religious, political, financial, personal. One or both parents exert a strong authoritarian control. Parents who were highly involved in your life and didn't allow room for growth may have also failed to meet your basic needs by preventing this development. Eventually, you need independence and the chance to form a sense of self. They might imply or say outright that aligning with their expectations is a condition of their continued love and support. One or both parents are unable to provide or threaten to withdraw financial or basic physical care for their children. Similarly, one or both parents fail to provide their children with adequate emotional support. You were expected to meet unrealistic expectations, like keeping the union together. Your needs weren't met. Any type of abuse is toxic. It doesn't just apply to physical violence. Abuse also includes sexual comments about your body, name calling, harsh or extreme criticism, gaslighting. If this type of behavior happens repeatedly and there's never any resolution, it might be a toxic relationship. Dysfunction is chronic or persistent. When patterns like the above are the norm rather than the exception, they systematically foster abuse. What makes the royal family unique, I get unique, a bit peculiar. What makes the royal family unique is that it's not just a family. The royal family is a brand name for the institution, the institution of monarchy. It's the firm, it's the family business. So the royal family has immense control, obviously over financials, but not only that, Harry and Meghan correctly identify in the documentary that the royal family also has a connection to the media. Through the royal rota and its special relationship to the press, the royal family can perpetuate its abuse through both the institution and the media. They have a way to broadcast their toxicity and try to convince all of us, all the people that participate or not even participate, but are just influenced by the media because we know that media can subconsciously affect us even if we don't necessarily partake in that media. The royal family can conduct toxic behavior out in the open and have a media market gaslight all of us into believing that their behavior and their actions are acceptable because one, we don't get the full story about what's going on in their lives until there are books written about it and there are people that investigate what's happened behind closed doors. The biggest thing that I believe Prince William and Prince Harry have in common, both in the St. Andrews example and in the documentary with Prince Harry, is the vicious cycle that's perpetuated in which safety and security is contingent on giving up freedom. Because there's a media frenzy, which the royal family perpetuates by engaging with the media in the way that they do, because of that, members of the family require intense security. The media landscape creates the environment in which the royals are so unsafe. Obviously, they would need security. They are the royal family, but they definitely exacerbate that issue, which is exactly Harry and Meghan's point. The royal family is responsible for briefing against other members of the royal family. Where he's uh, said that the, they, whoever they is, but it's the palace or the media, uh, wouldn't tell the truth to protect us, but they would do to protect William. Well, I mean, I, I'm pretty fed up with Harry and Meghan, to be honest with you, and I think um, most people are, and, uh, you know, they need to just go away and live their lives. It's absolutely appalling that Harry and Meghan are forcing the press to write about them all of the time. We don't want to. No, they make us. It's a form of bullying, really. Yeah, in, in many ways, the real victims are the press. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there are so many other things we want to be writing about, but no, we have to write about them. They're so selfish. However, however having said that, there is probably some truth in that, in the sense that the palace in particular was very keen to make sure that the heir to the throne yes. uh, was protected and Harry could be sacrificed if necessary. And actually, when I was working, I, I shouldn't give the name of the paper, but I was doing a piece for the, one of the nationals, writing a piece. 
And I was told, because uh, I'm quite critical of the monarchy in many ways, I was told I could, I could say what I wanted about Harry and Meghan, but I had to lay off William and Kate. That was the instruction from the editor. So that I think there was an element of truth in what he says. And creating dangerous environments for royal members where they need that security. It's, it's Diana again, right? That, it's Diana all over again. If we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, being physically and emotionally safe and secure is a pretty important thing for you to function in your everyday life, which again is a very reoccurring theme in the documentary. Harry and Meghan have had to experience that fear of safety and security being taken away. And eventually the royal family does take away that safety and security and we see through their story, how dangerous and how concerning that would be for them. We see how that changes their life. Side note, Tyler Perry has a great house, like an absolutely amazing house. If you need safety and security, what does the royal family ask of its members in order to continue providing safety and security? Which again, they need safety and security because of the media frenzy, which the royal family actively participates in. What do they need to promise? They have to give up some of their most basic human freedoms in the name of doing their duties, doing their role, performing their function within the family business. What's this dynamic actually saying to everybody in the royal family? I need you to do what we tell you to do because it's good for everyone else but yourself. Prince William, I know you don't wanna to go to the University of St. Andrews and have voiced that multiple times, but you need to do that for the union. You need to do that to keep Scotland within the fold. You need to do that because it will look bad on the university. You need to do that because it will look bad on you, bad on your family. It'll give us negative media attention, negative media attention to the family, negative media attention to the school. It'll look badly on the British government. You need to stay at the university for everyone else's benefit except for yours, which is pretty fucked up, isn't it? You don't get to do what you wanna do because you have to sacrifice your emotional, mental, physical well-being. Let's take it back to Prince Harry for a second. In Harry's case, he's explicitly stated that he wanted to make so many decisions for himself that he was blocked by because he was guilted into believing that he had to do things for the greater good, for everybody else to profit, but himself. This is most obvious when Harry and Meghan talk about their wanting to move to a Commonwealth nation. They say, we don't wanna participate in the Royal Rota system that's centered in London. So we will work with the family, be part of the business. However, we have a clear boundary here that we don't want to engage with the Royal Rota. And so they came up with multiple plans of how they could have that freedom while still functioning within the family. And as we've seen talking about toxic family dynamics, the toxicity tends to come up when you are trying to enforce boundaries, when they try to exert some freedom and control over their lives, the family starts to control them. But the royal family has many different spheres of influence to exert that control. And part of that can be through the media, through say, leaking their plans of where they wanted to go. It can be through lies and deception. Like for example, releasing a press statement from Prince William and Prince Harry that Prince Harry did not co-sign. The cycle continues, the circle continues. If you want safety and security, you must not have freedom. When you have freedom and control over yourself, 
you therefore will lose safety and security. And control. Is one of the big red flags of toxicity. Will should completely understand where Harry is coming from. Both have dealt with pressures to not follow their own desires, while everyone else around them benefits. Both have dealt with an inability to trust anyone outside their circle. Again, another tactic for abuse to isolate you into a circle that is easily manipulated and controlled and to create a situation in which you distrust people outside of the circle. Did I not clearly explain the circle of trust to you, Greg? Mm. Yeah, I think I got it. Then is there something you want to tell me? Mm, I, I don't think so. Didn't we have a discussion yesterday in the car about this? Oh, yes. You mean, yes. You mean me and Pam. Yes, I would love to talk to you about that. We're not that. talking about Pam, Greg. We're talking about you. See, if I can't trust you, Greg, then I have no choice but to put you right back outside the circle. And once you're out, you're out. There's no coming back. Hmm. Well, I would definitely like to stay inside the circle. Well, then tell me the truth. Jack, I don't know what we're talking about. Both have dealt with intrusion into their personal lives and both are part of this toxic dynamic so that other people can make money. And that's the T for everyone else to make money except for you. You sacrifice everything. You sacrifice your private life. You sacrifice your time for photo ops. You sacrifice your energy, where you want to go, what you want to do, where what you want to be, so that everybody else in this situation can profit. The royal family profits because they get some positive PR, which then in turn allows them to continue to exist within a monarchical system, which if they're not in the media, people will question why there should be a monarchy in the first place. They get to profit because the taxpayers will continue to provide funds. The media gets to profit because they get their photo ops, they get their interviews, they get the tea, they get the drama, they get the scoops, and that in turn helps them to sell papers. And the University of St. Andrews gets to profit because they get to use Prince William and Kate Middleton's prestige, use their name, their influence, to continue to sell the university as an elite institution, to encourage more people to participate in a school that frankly is not doing very well right now. Like we saw, the university didn't give a fuck what Prince William was actually doing and actually providing him a quality education. Because we all live in a society, we all participate in this system. We are the consumers of this media and we take what is given to us by media and perpetuate it. And that can't be helped in some ways. We as human beings take in information in so many subconscious ways and produce narratives in so many subconscious ways that we don't necessarily know when we're perpetuating certain biased narratives. I think St. Andrews should reconsider their connection to the royal family. Now, there's, there's obviously some parts of the story that they should reconsider in that they don't necessarily make the university look very good, such as, you know, Wills and Kate not actually wanting to be there and their feeling of being trapped in by outside forces. And we haven't even gotten into why Kate probably felt that way, but. But the main crux of the issue is that St. Andrews is profiting off of a glorified, glossy version of the Wills and Kate story that doesn't match up with the horrors of the reality that they experienced. Through their marketing, through their use of Wills and Kate, they are gaslighting the public about how that story actually went down. And the question is, why? Why is St. Andrews focused so much on Wills and Kate? There's plenty of other alumni from St. Andrews. We read the list, shall we? James Black, the winner of the 1988 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Olivier Sarkozy, the half-brother of Nicolas Sarkozy. Alex Salmon, former leader of the SNP. 
Dr. Fiona Hill, a foreign policy specialist that testified in the Trump impeachment hearings. David Holmes, an American diplomat that also testified against Trump. Helen Bannerman, the writer of the story of Little Black Sambo. Maybe not that one. <laughs> Thomas Boldler, the guy where we get the word Boldler eyes. <laughs> Oh, uh, maybe that's not great either. <laughs> Jonathan Taylor Thomas? I didn't know this. This is news to me. <laughs> little, little JTT? <laughs> Lion King? Lion King kid? Oh, we did a year abroad. That don't count. That don't count. I'm sorry. I went there for all four years, okay? None of this American shit you went there for a semester abroad. <laughs> Ian McDermott, great actor. Jean Palmera, famous for being dead. <laughs> Abigail Thorne from Philosophy Tube. Probably the most awesome alumni we've had. The point is, <laughs> this is getting on, going too long. The point is, why Wills and Kate? Now you're gonna say, obviously, because they're fucking royalty. And yes, yes, that that is the correct answer. But let's go deeper than that. Why do they care about royalty? Why do they care about perpetuating that connection for decades at this point? Their legacy is continuing to live on with even current university students. So why is that? Well, it seems like St. Andrews is more focused on trying to connect themselves to quote unquote traditional values, traditional education, traditional schooling. They seem very focused on carrying on tradition rather than modernizing their education. St. Andrews resting on their elite reputation and their connection to the royal family is holding them back. There's a lot of emphasis on this word tradition and tradition has a lot of different meanings. Tradition can be things like raisin weekend, but tradition has a lot of other baggage that comes along with the term. And this focus and emphasis on tradition, instead of modernizing, updating, improving, it's exactly the same problem that the royal family is having today. They have the image of being elitist because they profit off of it. But by being elitist, they're not doing their part to make sure that the university is a safe, welcoming, hospitable environment for all learners. They try to provide that as best they can for say, William, but seemingly not for others. As we've seen from clips that have come up already, they allow for their students to engage in casual sexism. And they are also perpetuating systematic racism. And holy shit, we do not have time to cover that in this video. So we're saving that for story two, okay? Come back, come back watch, enjoy. If you want to talk about racism, oh boy, stay tuned folks. Oh God, the editing is going to be a nightmare. I can tell. You know, you can just feel it in your editing bones. So my thinking's all a little bit jumbled, but what, what does this all come down to? I, as a, a lay person, got really excited in this sort of connection to the royal family. It was really fun to be like, yeah, I go to this school that has this connection to royalty and its connection to this royal love story of Will and Kate meeting and having that all be a sort of part of my university experience just tangentially makes me feel in some ways that I unconsciously perpetuated and, and participated in the sort of royal circus, in the royal hullabaloo. I'm one of those people in the walkabouts. I'm one of those people that watch their wedding, especially at St. Andrews because of that connection. We participated in the royal spectacle. We were spectators. You know, part of that, you know, it, it does bring joy, it is something that does give us some sort of emotion some sort of catharsis. It's hard for me to come to terms with the fact that I am in some ways complicit because, listen, I'm not gonna say I've never Googled them. That kind of stuff can be fun and, and interesting and playful. However, when you click, you are saying that you want that kind of content. That That's just how the internet works. Doesn't even matter if you click on it and you dislike it. If you click on something or you take that information in. 
in some way. You are feeding the beast. And as someone that, again, was going to university in this space where they were getting engaged, getting married. This was the, the next generation, the royal family, the next generation, as the crown is gonna be called. There was a willingness to, yes, and enjoy the fact that they loved each other and found each other, but that there was still always going to be undercurrents of nastiness. Because again, nastiness gets the clicks, gets the views. Now, I don't think that's right. This experience that I participated in, actively participated in, was complicit, perpetuated you know, the mythos of the royal family. And I can acknowledge the pain and the hurt that they must have gone through. That experience for them caused such trauma that they are not taking that experience and processing it and are instead pushing that trauma onto other people, namely their family. And if they had some empathy and understanding for each other, listen, it, it still wouldn't do shit, but like, if only we could hope that families could move on from their fucking traumas, man. Uh, spicy. All right, I think we're done. I think we're done with this story.